to my relationship to the curveball. Nobody gets it. Okay, I want to begin with two words in response to our leadoff hitter who uh, Professor Lepore has taken off. No, oh, she's here, okay. Two words in response to our discussion of the greatest shortstop of all time, Jose Reyes. Had, I just want to venture, had Daisy Campbell lived in 2011, who would she be writing love letters to? Derek Cheetah? I don't think so. I don't think so. Whatever. Um, historic, I'm, I'm supposed to talk about U.S. Latin American relations. Historically, many Latin Americans, I think, have viewed U.S. Latin American relations really much in the same way that Red Sox fans are starting to view the American League East. No matter what you do, no matter how good things are going, the Yankees always end up on top. Baseball and U.S. Latin American relations have always been intertwined. Uh, baseball historian Bert Solomon, who I think is not one of the great historians of the 20th century, uh, writes that in 1946, an aspiring 20-year-old pitcher named Fidel Castro had a trial with the Washington Senators. Had he made the team, the story goes, the history of U.S. Latin American relations might have played out very differently. But alas, Castro was cut, so he, and I quote, returned to Cuba to pursue other interests. <laughs> Now, that's, that story, unfortunately, is, is false. Uh, Castro did play, he played for the University of Havana team. He apparently was scouted by the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, but, but that's it. But, but, but Castro was and is a huge baseball fan. He apparently, and this apparently is true, listened to radio broadcasts of the 1958 World Series while organizing rebel forces in the Sierra Maestro Mountains in 1958 at a press conference right after the fall of Batista uh, he asked, he interrupted the press conference to ask a Spanish language baseball broadcaster why the Milwaukee Braves had pitched Warren Spahn instead of Lou Burdett in game six. And in, in, his, in the first year of the revolution, when you would imagine Castro had a few things to do, he w actually uh, barnstormed with a baseball team called Los Barbudos, the, the, the bearded ones. Apparently his salary as comandante was not high enough, so he too had to, to barnstorm. <laughs> And in fact, nearly all of the United States' main enemies in Latin America are Major League Baseball fans. Hugo Chavez grew up dreaming of playing for the San Francisco Giants. He also uh, once threw out the pitch for my first pitch for my beloved New York Mets. Uh, and ironically enough, Nicaraguan revolutionary leader Daniel Ortega is a fan of the Yankees. Um, now, the question is, can, can baseball offer us any special insights into U.S. Latin American relations? Probably not. But I, I couldn't say that to Jay Harris when he invited me to be on this panel, so let me give it a shot. What can baseball tell us about how the United States exercises its power in Latin America? The U.S. exercises its power in two ways, through force, or what Joe and I calls hard power, or through persuasion, or what Joe and I calls soft power. There are no shortage of examples of the United States imposing its will by force in Latin America. The Marines landed on Caribbean shores 34 times between uh, 1898 and 1933. They occupied Nicaragua and uh, Haiti for two decades, the Dominican Republic and Cuba for nearly a decade. Just in the last 50 or 60 years, the U.S. has toppled, or helped topple governments in Guatemala, in Chile, Guana uh, Grenada, Panama, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua. But the United States also has tremendous amount of soft power in the Americas, and this soft power is rooted in a vast web of economic, political, technocratic, social, and cultural ties to the region, what Luke and Wei and I call linkage. Anglo and Latin Americans increasingly speak each other's languages, we eat each other's food, we listen to each other's music, Latin Americans buy our exports, they watch our movies, their elites study in US universities, their migrants move here, feeding what has become a massive circular flow of people, money, ideas, and cultural practices. And of course, Latin Americans play baseball, or at least they do in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, Panama, Mexico, Colombia, and increasingly Brazil. Now, it's widely believed that Latin American baseball is a product of U.S. military occupation, the ultimate exercise of hard power. And in fact, there is an impressive correlation between where baseball took hold in the Americas and where the U.S. Marines landed. 
Cuba, Nicaragua, DR, Puerto Rico, Panama. But social science, lesson number one, correlation is not the same thing as causation. And if you look closely, the causal story is actually very different. Baseball was mainly a product of linkage, of social and commercial ties. Baseball arrived in Cuba in the 1860s, 30 years before the first US military occupation. In 1864, a Cuban student, student who'd been studying in Alabama, of all places, brought a bat and ball home with him to Cuba. And within a few years, he and other fellow Cubans who had been studying in the US had formed the Havana Baseball Club. At the same time, mid-1860s, baseball took off among Cuban dock workers who interacted with personnel from US cargo ships carrying sugarcane. Far from an agent of US imperialism, or any imperialism, baseball was initially a vehicle for liberation in Cuba. From the beginning, baseball in Cuba was associated with opposition to Spanish colonial rule. Spanish authorities tried unsuccessfully to ban baseball in favor of bullfighting. And the independence movement in Cuba used baseball both rhetorically and organizationally. Pro-independence activists often met under cover of uh, baseball team meetings and baseball workouts leading Spanish colonial authorities to cancel the Cuban League's entire season in 1894. As uh, historian Lu uh, Luis Perez put it, baseball became identified with the cause of Cuba Libre, fully integrated into the mystique of national liberation. Um, so by the time that the US Marines occupied the country in 1898, baseball was already Cuba's national pastime. But for good measure, the United States turned on and banned bullfighting. Um, Nicaragua apparently got baseball the same way as Cuba did. Wealthy students who'd been studying in the United States came back and brought baseball. Now it was actually the Cubans and not the gringos who brought baseball to the DR, to Puerto Rico, and to Venezuela. It was Cuban refugees who brought baseball to the DR in 1886, again many years, several years before US occupation began. Apparently it was a Cuban factory owner who brought baseball to Venezuela. Uh, Pedro Julio Santana, an early historian of Dominican baseball, compares the spread of baseball in the Caribbean to the spread of Christianity. He wrote that Jesus could be compared to the North Americans, but the apostles are the ones who spread the faith, and the apostles were the Cubans. If the Cubans had been half as successful in spreading revolution in the 1960s as they had been in spreading baseball a century earlier, the United States really would have been in trouble. Now, Many Cubans, Dominicans, and Nicaraguans deeply resented US military occupations in the early 20th century. But even the most anti-imperialist of them embraced US baseball. As Dominican historian Pedro Julio Santana put it, you can say Yankees go home, but when you're talking about the New York Yankees, you're talking about a respected institution throughout the Dominican Republic. <laughs> he, he got a few things wrong. Baseball is not thought of as the sport of Yankee imperialists. That's a stupid way of thinking. Baseball is the greatest thing that the United States has given us. In my opinion, they've not given us anything of value except baseball. <laughs> this love for US baseball is something that not even the most anti-imperialist, the most revolutionary of Latin American governments have been able to break. In Nicaragua, the Sandinista government's deep conflict with the United States in the 1980s did not stop Nicaraguans from following every pitch thrown by Dennis Martinez, the first Nicaraguan to pitch in the major leagues. Martinez gained the nickname El Presidente because he was so popular that he was believed to be able to win any election back home in Nicaragua. In Cuba, despite the Castro government's efforts to declare pitcher Orlando Hernandez persona non grata after he defected in 1997, El Duque became a huge sensation on the island when he helped pitch the Yankees to the World Series. And at the same time that Hugo Chavez talks about an impending US invasion, Venezuelan baseball players are currently taking the major leagues by storm. There were 62 Venezuelans on major league rosters on opening day this year, including stars, my own favorite, Johan Santana, Victor Martinez, Mario Ordonez, Miguel Cabrera, Felix Hernandez, Francisco Rodriguez, otherwise known as K-Rod. <laughs> now, what is my point? I'm not sure I have a point. But <laughs> One of the findings of my recent research on democratization is that since the end of the Cold War, the United States has been much, much more successful in promoting democracy in places where it maintains very strong socioeconomic, political, and cultural ties. Dominican Republic, Panama, Nicaragua, Mexico, Guatemala, Guyana. Where ties are weak, US democracy promotion has generally failed. Places like Burma, Iran, Zimbabwe, Cambodia. From that perspective, US policy towards Cuba has been totally wrong-headed. The US wants to influence Cuba's political future. It should be building ties rather 
than cutting them. Rather than imposing trade embargoes, it should be encouraging the flow of people, money, goods and services, ideas, and of course, baseball players. U.S. ties to Cuban baseball were severed pretty thoroughly in the early 1960s along with a range of other ties, uh, which is tragic on, on, on a number of fronts. Um, there have been some efforts at what is called baseball diplomacy since then, but most of these efforts have been shot down. Castro invited the New York Yankees to play in Havana in 1975. He was rebuffed. A couple of years later, Jimmy Carter pushed the idea of a spring training game between Cuba and a team of U.S. All-Stars. That plan was aborted. In 1999, the uh, Baltimore Orioles actually split a two-game series uh, with Cuba, but they were, they were harshly criticized for that. And that year, in 1999, a New York congressman introduced the Baseball Diplomacy Act, which would grant Cuban players special visas to play in the United States without having to defect. But that bill went nowhere. That's a shame on a number of levels. U.S. bullying has never been all that effective in Latin America, and that is particularly true of the contemporary post-Cold War era. The United States wants to maintain influence in Latin America, what it needs to do, I think, is strengthen the transnational ties that bind it socially and culturally to the region. Baseball is one such tie. That tie has done more than just produced legendary ball players like Clemente, Marcel, Carew, Pedro Martinez, Albert Pujols, I should add the greatest shortstop of all time, Jose Reyes. <laughs> it has done more than just produced those players. It has produced in Latin America, a genuine love and admiration for a United States institution that not even military invasions, wars, and trade embargoes have been able to break. You cannot say that about many U.S. institutions. Let me stop there.